Hi, this is Emerald and welcome to the Diamond Net and today I'm going to be talking to you about whether human beings are innately good or innately evil. Alright, so this is the fifth video in the Shame and Love series and it's all about exploring the question of whether human beings are inherently good or inherently evil. Now, like I said, it's the fifth video in a series. I have another playlist called the Shame and Love series. You can check that out if you would like to, but you don't have to go back and watch it to understand this video. But this video is all about understanding shame at a very, very deep level so that you can remedy your own feelings of shame and let go of them. So for a quick definition of what shame is, shame is basically the feeling state that's associated with exile and it operates off of the understanding that we are invalid in some way. So some examples of some shame beliefs would be like, I'm bad, I'm evil, I'm not good enough, there's something wrong with me, etc. And shame is fully distinct from other similar emotions like embarrassment or guilt. With embarrassment, it's, oh no, people saw me doing something that I didn't want them to see me doing, or they're seeing me in a light that I didn't want them to see me in. And with guilt, it's, oh no, I did something wrong and I feel bad about doing something wrong. Whereas shame is the sense that there's something about our existence itself that is wrong, that we're a mistake, that we're invalid in some way. And so with that definition, of shame in mind that brings us into today's topic around two conflicting philosophies that have been debated by many philosophers over the centuries. One of those philosophies being that people are inherently good and the other philosophy being that people are inherently bad. And when it comes to shame, which is the feeling state that's associated with believing that we are bad, if we have the idea that human beings as a whole are inherently bad, this of course can produce a lot of shame. So let's explore the implications of both of these philosophies. So with the philosophy that people are inherently bad, this gives the implication that in order to solve the problem of our own badness, that we have to find some kind of way to purify and cleanse ourselves of certain elements of our nature. And this purification is typically attempted internally by repressive means when we try to solve the problem of our own badness and oppressive means on the outside when we try to solve the problem of other people's badness. So with the belief that we're inherently bad, this requires us to use shame as a tool in order to cut away all of the rotten parts of our nature and to shape and mold ourselves into upstanding citizens. And if we don't shame ourselves enough or we're not disciplined or authoritarian enough with ourselves and others, the idea is that we'll fall back into the dominion of our inherently evil nature either individually or collectively. And from the standpoint of this philosophy, the solutions to our inherent badness have to always be top down and authoritarian and never bottom up. And that's because in this philosophy, the bottom core of our nature is badness. So we can't really trust anything that comes from the bottom. So we have to use strength of will and reason and all sorts of other things to try to contain our inherently bad nature. And since this philosophy throws so much doubt into the quality of our own character, we can no longer be internally guided by our own sense of intuition. We actually have to look outside to a system of rules or to, towards certain authoritarian leaders that have properly purified themselves so that they can lead the bad licentious masses out of their own badness. So these are just some of the implications that people are inherently bad, but it's ultimately going to impact all sorts of different areas of life from how we parent our children to how we think about justice to how we orient to our own instincts and basically anywhere we have to make a decision, it's also going to impact us as well. In contrast, the implications that arise from the philosophy that people are inherently good is that there's an underlying goodness at the core of our nature. And to the degree that people have begun to behave badly is the degree to which they have gotten out of alignment with their core nature. So if you can imagine that that core goodness is like a light and then all sorts of other external factors can cover over that light with many layers of coping mechanisms and traumas and all sorts of other things to absorb obscure that light. But the light of that goodness always exists there within this philosophy. Well, and ultimately, the way that we get back in touch with that goodness is by healing from trauma and by bringing ourselves generally back into alignment with our core nature. 
And to promote goodness in others, we have to provide people with the right tools and the right environment to get back in touch with that goodness. And with small children, the main goal is to keep them in touch with that goodness. And there also tends to be a recognition within the philosophy that people are inherently good, that some people might just be too far gone and very, very statistically unlikely to get back to the core of their own goodness. So even though the goodness is always there, not everybody is going to get back to their own goodness within this lifetime. And in contrast to the top-down solutions that would be necessary to address people's negative behavior in the philosophy that people are bad, instead more bottom-up solutions are proposed. For example, if we think about the orientation to justice, under the philosophy that people are inherently good, there tends to be a focus on rehabilitation as opposed to on condemning and punishing. And even in the word rehabilitation, rehabilitation basically means to bring something back to its original state. So if someone has committed crimes, the idea of rehabilitation is the idea that there is an original state of goodness that that person can be brought back to. Now, shadow work, which I talk about frequently on my channel, would be an example of a bottom-up solution to people's negative behaviors. The idea is that you go down to the very roots of what's going on for the person psychologically and emotionally, and you address those roots at a deep level so that whatever negative behavior is coming up no longer needs to come up. So if we take the example of, let's say, somebody is expressing some kind of greedy behavior, um, and ultimately, from the perspective that people are inherently good and we try to use shadow work essentially to bring someone back into alignment with their deeper, truer nature. The idea is that that greed is probably rooting down to some kind of trauma or some kind of unmet need. So if in childhood they dealt with the trauma around scarcity and not having enough food to eat or, you know, maybe feeling a lack in some other kind of way, that the greedy behavior might come up as a coping mechanism for that. So that ultimately, the negative behavior is more of a symptom of a deeper root cause as opposed to just some inherent badness. Whereas in contrast, in the philosophy that people are inherently bad, the idea is that that greedy behavior would simply be just coming from our inherent badness, our inherently bad nature as human beings. And that in order to solve the problem of that greed, we're just going to get have to get really, really disciplined and, you know, to try to cut away at the parts of ourself that are are greedy and to try to keep ourselves on the straight and narrow. And it sort of takes the position of like a man against nature kind of approach where our negative behaviors that come up are just nature and then we have to actually tame and fight back that nature using shame. And so it's basically, no, that's bad, get rid of it. No, that's bad, get rid of it. No, that's bad, get rid of it. Now, if we operate off of the philosophy that people are bad and we shame others to get them to stop expressing some kind of badness and that shaming is actually effective and they internalize the shame, well, those aspects of themselves that they've shamed away don't actually go away. Those aspects of the self just get fragmented off from the whole of the personality and then placed in the shadow. The shadow is basically like the dark closet of the psyche where we put aspects of ourself where we want to forget about them. But ultimately they're still there and they're still exerting some kind of influence on us. So whenever we push something into the shadow, it still has its impacts. The only difference is that now it's autonomous from the conscious personality. And so we don't have any conscious control over those aspects. And so instead of being aware of it and being able to like temper those behaviors, now they come up unconsciously and they usually have a much more negative expression once we start shaming away and repressing these aspects. So let's give an example of how this might play out. So let's say that Lenny was raised by parents that were either consciously or unconsciously operating off of the philosophy that people are bad. And so whenever Lenny as a child started to express some kind of negative behavior, his parents would come in and do what they saw as their due diligence and come in and shame him and make him feel uh, totally horrible about expressing those qualities. And the parents were doing this ultimately under the impression that this would make uh, Lenny a good person. You know, it would kind of shape him into a good kid. And so ultimately when they started to shame him for things, it worked. And so he internalized this shame. So let's say that these parents were operating off of the notion that anger is a reflection of humanity's inherent badness. 
right? So they've started to shame Lenny now as a child for any time that he feels anger. And so now Lenny internalizes that shame about anger and he basically tries to push away, repress and deny all parts of himself that are angry and that basically have anything to do with anger. Now, one of the main issues here is that anger isn't inherently bad. Anger is an instinct that very much makes sense for it to be there, and it has both positive and negative expressions. Anger is essentially in its best form, a kind of protection mechanism against powerlessness, and it gives us the ability to set boundaries. Anger totally makes sense that it would be there as an instinct, but because Lenny's parents have shamed him for feeling anger and expressing anger, Lenny then whenever he feels anger in himself, starts to push that anger away. But the thing is, the anger doesn't go away. It's an instinctual part of human nature, so he can't get rid of it. So whenever Lenny tries to suppress and deny this anger in himself, it just tends to come out in sneakier ways, like through passive aggressiveness and spiteful behavior, or it might even turn inward toward himself in the form of self-hatred and self-judgment and self-criticism. And Lenny, as a result of denying his own anger and shaming himself for it, might even go through cycles where he suppresses his anger and then explodes, and then it suppresses his anger and then explodes. And every time he has one of these anger explosions, he sees that again as an indication of the badness of his own nature. So again, if Lenny has internalized the notion that people are inherently bad, when he sees that anger, he goes, oh, that's a sign of my inherent badness, so I need to double down on the shaming mechanism so I can pre repress that anger away better. And he has this idea that if he's strict enough with himself or he's authoritarian enough with himself and he shames himself enough that he's going to be able to effectively keep the anger away. And so what he gets into is this big cycle of repressing and then exploding and then repressing and then exploding. And he sees that repression and that shaming as a solution, but it's really part of the cycle. It's something that winds the spring up. It tightens the springs so that the backlash effect happens later on. So this goal, of purifying and shaming away his own badness actually backfires on him. So to give an analogy to Lenny's situation, let's say that there's a jack in the box. And in this situation, the jack represents Lenny's anger and cranking the lever represents him shaming himself. And so what Lenny does is he shoves Jack down in the box to get rid of his anger and he closes the lid tight and says, oh, I hope that that anger doesn't get out of there. And he's under the misguided impression that cranking the lever is somehow going to tighten the lid to the box and make sure that Jack doesn't jump out of it. And so he cranks the lever very hard and very fast. And then of course, Jack pops back out of the box. And then he feels disappointed and ashamed of himself that he didn't crank the lever hard enough in order to keep Jack down in the box. And so he redoubles his efforts and he cranks the lever even harder and even faster next time. And of course, Jack pops out of the box again. Again, if the lever, cranking the lever represents him shaming himself, there is a misguided impression that him shaming himself is actually going to push away his anger, when in reality, it just kind of winds the anger response up. It puts resistance against it. And then of course, eventually that anger is gonna pop out. Just like if you shove Jack down in the box and you crank the lever, Jack is gonna pop out. And this tends to be one of the common patterns that comes about when someone holds the philosophy that people are inherently bad. And so with this philosophy, shame becomes a tool that we use to suppress our own badness. But if we understand how repression works and we understand how shadow work works, we know that this doesn't actually solve the problem. Ultimately, whatever we push into the shadow is still going to be there. And ultimately, whatever we try to suppress is also still going to be there. And it's very common that this shaming, repression, and suppression often leads to the destructive behaviors that we're trying to prevent. Now, back in the third video in the shame and love series where I talked about the most dangerous archetype, I talked about the origin point for shame and how it relates to the creation story in the book of Genesis. And basically within the creation story, Adam and Eve eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And once they have the filter of good and evil in their minds, they realize that they're naked and they start to feel shame. So this is the origin point for shame for them. And as a result of eating the fruit, Adam and Eve were cast out of the Garden of Eden into a state of separation 
separation and exile, and this constituted the original sin, which is oftentimes interpreted in such a way that it really uh, lends itself to the, the philosophy that people are bad. But the creation story is a potent allegory for how shame arises in us and the effects of that shame. So shame arises for us when we begin to view ourselves and reality through the dualistic lens of good and evil, and this makes us feel a sense of exile and separation from all other things. It puts us into this state of feeling like an exile of reality itself. And so the things that go on for us when we feel shame are symbolically represented in the series of events that Adam and Eve went through in the story. Now, the reason why conceptualizing of reality and ourselves, the dualistic lens of good and evil produces shame for us is because of what the words good and evil imply. Good tends to imply worthy of existence and evil tends to imply unworthy of existence. And once we start to sort reality and all the things in it into two categories, categories of these are the things that are valid to exist and these are the things that are invalid to exist, it basically opens the door to the potential of our own invalidity. And once the door is open to the possibility of our own invalidity, it gets us away from the recognition of the inherent wholeness and perfection of that which is. And when this happens, we start to view reality as something that can make mistakes. And once we view reality as something that can make mistakes, it opens up the potential that we are a mistake that reality made, or that our whole species is somehow a mistake that reality made. Then once that possibility is open that we might be a mistake, this causes us to then repress away, deny, and get rid of any parts of ourselves that we think could compromise our own validity. And then we exile these shamed parts out of our conscious personality and into the shadow in the same way that Adam and Eve were exiled from the Garden of Eden. And when these aspects are splintered off and relegated to the shadow, they feel not only disconnected from the rest of our personality, but also disconnected from reality at large, giving them a sense of being cast into outer darkness. And from there, these shamed aspects start to exert their influence on the personality on a covert level. And this often leads to a lot of negative expressions, which then further cements the possibility that we're inherently bad or that we're a mistake in some way. And so it tends to lead right back into the cycle of shaming and repression. Now in the creation story, it's the devil that tempts Adam and Eve to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when you devil something, you split it into two pieces. So if we take deviled eggs, for example, they're called deviled eggs because they're split into two halves. So the devil tempted Adam and Eve with the knowledge of good and evil because he was aware that when people start seeing things through the lens of good and evil, it basically fragments the wholeness of reality. So the person, instead of experiencing reality as whole and perfect and experiencing themselves as whole and perfect, now experience reality through the lens of good and evil and into this fragmentation of this wholeness. And once a person loses sight of the inherent wholeness and perfection in reality and in themselves, this pulls them out of a state of oneness and out of the state of unconditional love. And they start to feel splintered off from everything. They start to feel shamed and exiled and like they don't belong within reality. And this makes us feel like the great mistake of all creation and we get cast away from the garden. And this fragmentation and exile and casting away that comes from seeing reality through the lens of good and evil causes a person to splinter from the inside where they start to separate themselves into these two categories of good parts and bad parts. And they wanna hold on really, really tightly to the good parts to build an identity of goodness. And they wanna push away anything within themselves that could compromise that identity of goodness because they fear that those bad parts will invalidate them. And the shame that arises as a result of this internal splintering makes us feel like a stranger in a strange land, like we don't belong here in the universe, and that we have to somehow do something or cleanse ourselves of our badness in some way to feel a sense of belonging here in the universe. Now, I had mentioned before that reality is inherently perfect, and I'm aware that this might give some people pause and they would say, hang on a second, wait a minute, Emerald, what do you mean that reality is perfect? What about all of the disasters and tragedies and what about all the suffering and all of the mistakes? 
So with this in mind, I have to actually define what perfection means in the context that I mean it. So typically when people talk about something being perfect, something that's perfect is often thought of as something that's ideal. And ideal meaning that it matches the ideas in a person's head in terms of what it is that they want, what it is that they think is perfect, right? So let's say if I have some really good food and I have an idea in my head about what the perfect meal is and that that meal has happens to match it, then that means perfection. But the type of perfection that I mean is not so much about idealism at all. Really nothing in reality is ideal. But what I mean by perfection here is wholeness. Wholeness means perfection. And what wholeness means is that every ingredient of reality is always perfectly accounted for down to the positions of every grain of sand on the planet. So nothing is ever an absolute mistake in the grand scheme of things, even if it's not to people's liking, even if it's something that we as human beings would deem as very imperfect and very unideal. So we could understand it as everything is perfect, but nothing is ideal. So the recognition of the inherent wholeness of all things is something that you'll want to cultivate in order to remedy your feelings of shame. Basically, when we start to feel shame, it's because we feel like there's something invalid about ourselves. And when we recognize that we are inherently whole exactly as we are, we can start to accept ourselves as we are. Now that doesn't mean that we have to express our, our worst qualities, but we can accept that it's there. The psyche is essentially like the Wild West. It can contains the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so to the degree that we can hold space for all of that and recognize it as just part of what is, is the degree to which we can drop shame. And in order to unsplit and undevil ourselves and to remedy our shame, we can do so by holding space for all dualities within the personality and within reality at large. And this relates very much to um, an insight that my friend had on a medicine journey that he was participating in this past year he got the insight that to love means to hold space for something and its opposite all at once. Now to explore this notion that wholeness equals perfection deeper, I want to talk a bit about the Tao. And this is a representation of the Tao, and it's also referred to as the yin and yang symbol. And the Tao as a whole represents the inherent wholeness and perfection in all things. And it also represents the myriad of dualities that exist within the inherent wholeness and perfection in all things. Now let's think about the Tao as an egg. And if I come in and I devil that egg and I split it into two pieces and I say I accept this side as valid but not that side, then I deem this side of the Tao as invalid. I then bring myself out of alignment with the wholeness of the Tao and the Tao's nature. And instead I bring myself into the state of duality. Now with this representation of the Tao being a representation of wholeness, I want to talk about the Tao's true nature in contrast to the dualities that it holds within that wholeness. So the Tao as a whole represents something that's inherently positive, but the duality within the Tao contains with it both positivity in the relative and negativity in the relative. So I heard this at some point before being referred to as absolute positivity with a capital P containing both relative positivity with a lowercase p and relative negativity with a lowercase n. This is a good way to understand the nature of the Tao. Its truest nature is positivity as a whole, but it contains both positivity and negativity. So let's go through some examples. So the true whole nature of the Tao is absolute positivity that has no opposite, but the Tao contains both positivity positivity and negativity. And the true whole nature of the Tao is absolute goodness that has no opposite, but it contains both goodness and badness. And the true nature of the Tao is wholeness that has no opposite, but the Tao contains both wholeness and duality. And the true nature of the Tao is absolute infinity that has no opposite, but the Tao contains both the infinite and the finite. And the true nature of the Tao is absolute mercy that has no opposite, but the Tao contains both mercy and suffering. And the true nature of the Tao is absolute oneness that has no opposite, but the Tao contains both oneness and separation. And the true nature of the Tao is absolute perfection that has no opposite, but the Tao contains both perfection and imperfection. And the true nature of the Tao is absolute love that has no opposite, but the Tao contains both the loving and the unloving. And the true nature of the Tao is absolute truth that has no opposite, but the Tao contains both truth and falsehood. 
and the true nature of the Tao is absolute reality that has no opposite, but the Tao contains both reality and illusion. Now the important thing to understand here about the Tao is that the Tao is everything. So everything is part of the Tao and everything is all of the Tao simultaneously. So if I have an acorn, uh, this acorn is part of the Tao, right? So it's part of the inherent wholeness of all things. But the acorn also contains the Tao. The acorn is also all of the Tao. So the acorn is part of the Tao and the acorn is all of the Tao simultaneously. And the same is true for each of us. So you are part of the Tao, but you are all of the Tao at the same time. And so with all these truths about the Tao in mind, we come back to the question of are human beings inherently bad? Well, the answer to that question is absolutely not, but we contain both goodness and badness within us. Remember, you are the Tao itself. You are part of it and you are all of it. And so your deepest, truest nature is absolute goodness with no opposite. But within that absolute goodness, you contain relative badness and relative goodness. But when you reject, repress, and deny any elements of yourself that you've labeled as bad, what happens is this fragments you and splits your wholeness and obscures from you your true nature as the Tao. And so you forget that you are both part and whole of the Tao. So when we label parts of our ourselves and reality as valid and invalid, what this does is it fragments the wholeness into a duality and you start to become insulated from the Tao. So if the truest nature of the Tao is absolute goodness with no opposite, that contains both bad and good within itself. And when we reject and deny and try to obscure ourselves from the relative badness within our perspective, what ends up happening is that we get out of touch with the absolute goodness and start clinging on to relative goodness as an identity. And when we're in the perspective of duality, we reject goodness with a capital G to hold on very tightly to the identity of goodness with a lowercase g. Now, in relation to the topic of humanity's inherent goodness, I wanted to share with you some insights that arose for me a couple years ago when I participated in a medicine ceremony. Um, and basically, during that ceremony, what came up was the realization of the inherently loving nature of humanity. And I was seeing that even people who are the most misanthropic and the most negative amongst us, underneath all of that negativity, underneath all of that misanthropy, was a deep desire for kinship and to love and to be loved by all other human beings and to feel a deep connection with all elements of reality. And to the degree that someone has come out of alignment with that deeper loving nature is the degree that somebody has had this loving nature obscured by things like ignorance and trauma. And ignorance and trauma essentially creates all of these different layers of distortion that keep a person from connecting to the deeper light of their own absolute goodness. And because of this experience, it's given me a way to, in some ways, reverse engineer someone's motives to be able to find the core of what's motivating them to do what they are doing. You know, so if I look at somebody who is behaving in some kind of negative way, I can look and I can say, okay, I know that there is an inherently benevolent motive if you draw it down all the way to the core of the motivation. And so because I know the end point, I can start to figure out what's going on in the middle. And this can be really helpful actually for you to be able to understand your own deeper motives and to be able to drop feelings of shame at whatever expressions you might have that might be negative, as well as to be able to practice compassion and understanding for others. And this helps you recognize how the absolute good nature of the Tao even comes through relative expressions of badness. And once you start to recognize this and you start to drop judgment, you start to be able to exercise compassion and understanding, this helps you get back into connection with that inner light, that internal sense of innocence that's always there underneath everything. So with that in mind, how can we realize the absolute goodness that's there at the core of our nature and undevil our perspective so that we can let go of shame? Now the first thing is to accept that reality makes no mistakes. And this can be a little bit of a bitter pill to swallow because there's all sorts of terrible things that happen in reality. And of course, we're going to feel negatively about those things. So I'm not saying don't feel negatively about the bad things that happen. What I'm saying instead is to recognize that both the positive and the negative are all part of the great wholeness of everything. And wholeness basically just means everything that is 
is. Now with the statement that everything is is, it's actually quite a powerful statement. It seems at first like a tautology, you know, like A equals A, of course everything that is is, but there's so much more there than what language can convey. So if you can sit with the idea that everything is is and to recognize the inherent power in that statement and the like the depth of that statement, then you can start to come to the realization of the inherent perfection in all things. Basically, there's a kind of quality to the isness that means that it is exactly as it should be. So human beings tend to think in terms of this should be that way or that shouldn't be this way. But when we recognize that that which is is, we can start to let go of those shoulds and should nots. And with letting go of those, sh letting go of shoulds and should nots, we realize that everything is already in its whole state. Now, the second thing to do in order to get in touch with the inherent goodness of your perspective is to accept that the psyche has all things. Basically, it contains the good, the bad, and the ugly, like I said before. So there can be all sorts of different drives that arise within you, some positive drives, some negative negative drives, some neutral drives, and basically whatever comes up to be able to recognize that those things are valid to be there. Now that doesn't mean that we're going to go and do negative things or that we're going to cause destruction, but what we want to do is we want to be able to acknowledge and accept that those things are there as opposed to saying like, oh, I don't want to look at it, shame on me, oh, I hate myself, any of these things. We want to just recognize that we contain all opposites. One of the things that's quite helpful for this kind of self-acceptance is to realize that whatever happens to be coming up within you is impersonal to you. So it doesn't mean anything about your identity or your self-concept. Basically, it's as impersonal to you as the tree in the backyard, right? So basically, if you have goodness coming up, good drives, and you have more destructive bad drives coming up, then it doesn't mean that, oh, that means that you're a bad person or anything like that. What it just means is that the psyche is simply doing what it does. So accept that you have both badness and goodness within yourself. There's no need to express any of it, but it's really, really important that you acknowledge and accept that it's there. And it's important that you do this without labeling it as invalid. And the third thing you can do is you can start to try to notice the absolute benevolent motive that exists underneath all actions. Now, sometimes with this absolute benevolent motive, it can be distorted by all sorts of ignorances and traumas and coping mechanisms. Basically, there can be a lot of things that mangle up this inherently positive benevolent kind of motivation. So for example, if someone comes and steals my car, well, ultimately that person is is ignorant in the sense that they don't see me as part of themselves, so they're not in connection with their nature as the Tao and recognizing they're part of the same thing as me, and so they're making a decision that benefits them at my expense. But if we look at the absolute benevolent motive there, ultimately what that person is trying to do is they're trying to do something positive for themselves, like they're trying to procure some kind of transportation because maybe this is gonna make life easier for them, maybe they're gonna be able to make some money if they sell it, and so maybe that's going to make life easier for them as well. So ultimately, at the bottom level of that, there is a benevolent motive, and it's just basically oriented toward themselves. Now, when it comes to this absolute benevolent motive that we have, essentially, these absolute benevolent motives are meant to um, benefit anything that we label as self. So if I think of self as being only me, right, only this individual, then I could do a lot of selfish things based off of the sense of disconnection with all other elements of reality, which again comes from not seeing our true nature as the Tao. And so if I make decisions only based off of my own self-interested motives, I could certainly do something very un, un uh, basically very unloving toward anybody that would be labeled as other. So we will always serve self. We will not always serve other in this benevolent self-interested motive. But let's say that the person who is the car thief suddenly comes to the realization that they are one with everything and that something that's negative that's happening to 
someone else is essentially going to be impacting them as well, then they're not going to be able to steal that car without actually hurting themselves. And so ultimately, it's the ignorance of seeing the self as a relatively small thing when in reality, self is a oneness. Self includes everything. Self is the Tao. But it's also all the different traumas and hurts that make it to where a person might become insulated from the deeper goodness of their nature. And so when any person commits a bad action, there's always going to be some kind of benevolent motive there. Either the person wants to feel better, or let's say they want to cause something better to happen for themselves, or they want to get away from some negative feelings. And ultimately, when we start to recognize the absolute benevolent motive underneath all things, we can realize that no one is actually motivated by malevolence. Essentially, there's always a deeper positive motivation there that just gets kind of obscured and distorted through, let's say, ignorance and trauma and pain and all sorts of other layers that distort that benevolent motive. And so with regard to every action taken by ourselves or others, we can ask the question of what's the absolute benevolent motive underneath all things, and also how are these motives trying to serve self? Anyway, so that's all I have for you for now. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, go ahead, click the like button below and subscribe and leave me a comment down below. Also hit the notification bell. And if you would like to learn about shadow work and how to integrate your shadow, I have a free shadow integration masterclass called the six simple steps to shadow integration. And you can go to shadowintegration.org slash masterclass to access it. Anyway, that's all I have for you for now. And until next time, keep becoming more you. Thank you.